chicken wings, cheap beer, and women in flimsy orange shorts and weird flesh-colored pantyhose. You put those three elements together and you got Hooters, America's original restaurant. Hooters may have started out as a local bar and grill, but over the decades, it exploded into a worldwide chain of restaurants, along with a hotel and casino, an airline, and dozens of other successful offshoots of the brand. Today on Weird History Food, we're going to talk about the enlargement and reduction of Hooters. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food channel and let us know in the comments below what other oddly themed restaurants you'd like to know more about. And now, we're off to Hooters. According to the National Restaurant Association, eight out of every 10 restaurants in America will fail within the first five years of business. Six of those eight that fail won't even make it to their one year anniversary. Ask anyone who owns one, running a restaurant ain't easy. Knowing those statistics, it's a miracle Hooters exists, considering the world famous chain was originally conceptualized as a joke. Actually, that's not really that hard to believe. Every inch of Hooters feels like a very elaborate prank. It all began one day after a few rounds of beer. Six middle-aged buddies, Lynn Stewart, Gil DiGianantonio, Ed Drost, Billy Ranieri, Ken Wimmer, and Dennis Johnson, later referred to as the Hooters Six, thought it would be fun to open a bar in their neighborhood with cheap pints and simple bar food. Drost said he and his pals were inspired to open their own place after they couldn't find a bar where they could eat, drink, and get sloppy without worrying about the owner calling the cops on them. So going into the deal assuming the restaurant was going to go under anyway, Drost and his five friends pooled their money together. On October 4th, 1983, they opened a simple bar and grill located at 2800 Gulf to Bay Boulevard in Clearwater, Florida. They named their new restaurant Hooters, which was inspired by a pre-recorded Steve Martin monologue entitled I Believe, which aired on Saturday Night Live. And you should only refer to them as Hooters. The name would come to play in their marketing strategy later, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. In the beginning, the Hooters Six had no idea of what they were doing. And why would they? None of them had any experience in the restaurant industry. And during those first few months, they basically did everything you're not supposed to do when opening a restaurant. <gasps> For example, the guys were already starting off at a disadvantage. Their restaurant was housed in one of the worst buildings in Clearwater, Florida. The former nightclub was weather-beaten and centered in on a horrible part of town. And the space was infamous for failed business ventures. It was like a mythical siren luring small business owners. Drost recalls that he and his buddies were so unprepared, he had to beg a friend of his to drive down to the new restaurant and teach the back-of-house crew how to turn on the industrial kitchen equipment. A couple hours later on that same day, Drost admitted to paying two guys to impersonate Florida police officers and read his five business partners the riot act because they wanted to sell alcohol on their first day open, even though the beer license hadn't come through yet. In short, the Hooters Six were, eh, how do we put this politely, clowns. But the crazy thing is, as bad as Hooters began, it didn't crash and burn. Instead, the restaurant became popular almost immediately. After just a few months of being in business, there were already two-hour waits to get a table. You can't say this early success had to do with cheap beer and spicy hot wings, but everyone knows that Hooters' overnight success had everything to do with marketing. The restaurant business is incredibly competitive. There are hundreds of restaurants in every city. And with so many out there, a restaurant tour has two choices. They either have to offer up world-class food, or they need a good marketing angle. The Hooters menu of chicken wings, cheese sauce, and curly fries weren't threatening to win a Michelin star anytime soon. But the Hooters Six thought they had a great marketing angle, using hot women to serve their food. Now, stacking your waitstaff with a bunch of beautiful women in as little clothing as legally possible wasn't a new concept in the restaurant industry. Bikini bars had been around since the swinging 60s, and some coffee houses in Chile and Japan had been outfitting their all-girl barista teams in skimpy bathing suits and lingerie for years. Even Hugh Hefner was finding success in employing lingerie-clad bunnies as waitresses throughout his worldwide Playboy Club chain. So, following the less is more uniform policy, the Hooters Six came up with the Hooters Girls, but we'll learn more about them in a minute. As mentioned earlier, it didn't take long for Hooters to become a local success in Clearwater, Florida. Lines of men with ponytails trying to get a table wrapped around the restaurant every day. 
The beer and wing spot caused such a buzz that within less than a year in business, outside investors started sniffing around in hopes of expanding the brand and going national. After gaining national attention and realizing they had something bigger than the six of them could ever imagine, and to be honest, more than they could handle, the Hooters Six sold their expansion and franchise rights in 1984 to Robert H. Brooks, a gutsy businessman in the condiment and salad dressing game. Brooks soon replicated the magic of the original location on 2800 Gulf to Bay Boulevard and expanded to six locations in and around Clearwater in the late 80s. By 2006, Hooters had over 430 restaurants worldwide, including locations in Taiwan, Venezuela, and Switzerland. While most Hooters commercials and print ads at the time focused on the beer, the wings, and the atmosphere, it's probably safe to say the Hooters girls had something to do with the chain's immediate success as well. Why do I like Hooters? Well, I will give you two reasons, the boobs and the hot wings. <laughs> we all know what a Hooters girl is today. The orange shorts, tight white tank top, and beige tights are almost as universally recognized as Superman's S, or that really cool S everyone used to doodle in school. Yeah, you know the one. Sure, the concept of a woman slinging wings and mugs of beer in flimsy dolphin shorts may sound a little ridiculous nowadays, especially considering that Hooters now markets itself as a family-friendly restaurant, but hold your judgment, it was a different time in 1983. Back in the mid to late 80s, scoring a Hooters girl gig was a fairly prestigious achievement. It was right up there with becoming one of Hef's Playboy Playmates. The chain even attracted some women who used the gig as a stepping stone to bigger and better gigs. Oscar winner Amy Adams worked as a hostess in 1993, right out of college. Adams insists she never had to wear the uniform, although she did eventually become a waitress. And according to the official Hooters employee handbook, all waitresses are required to wear the designated Hooters girl uniform, even future Academy Award winners. Holly Madison, best known as a former girlfriend and employee of Hugh Hefner, also worked as a Hooters girl while attending Loyola Marymount University. Leanne Tweeden, who has gone on to become a radio broadcaster and sports commentator, once slung wings at the Hooters in Colorado Springs, Colorado, although she'll probably always be remembered for this photo of Elle Franken pretending to grope her chest. Former Playboy playmate Terry Harrison not only waited tables at Hooters, but she also competed in the National Hooters Beauty Pageant and got pretty far in the contest. Unfortunately, Harrison didn't take the title, but the exposure led to becoming one of Bob Barker's beauties on The Price is Right. And the late actress and singer Naya Rivera, who you might recognize from Glee as the shallow, promiscuous mean girl, briefly waitressed at the Hooters in Valencia, California, although she didn't like the gig very much. In 2013, she told Allure magazine that she had nightmares about working as a Hooters girl, mostly because the uniform seemed to give creepy male diners a license to leer. She wasn't exactly off base. More on that in a bit. Not satisfied with taking Hooters from one small local bar and grill to a global restaurant chain, Robert H. Brooks continued to expand the Hooters brand. By 1991, Hooters became the sponsor for an up-and-coming NASCAR driver, Alan Kulwicki. The following year, Kulwicki won the Winston Cup at the Hooters 500. Oh, hey, that worked out nicely. Brooks also ushered in Hooters Air, a legitimate airline that debuted in 2004. Hooters Air actually earned positive reviews for service and accommodations. Passengers seemed to enjoy the free wings served by real Hooters girls in the customized cabins that featured plush leather recliners with extra legroom. Yeah, free wings, but don't get excited. It went out of business in 2006. You just missed it. The year after he launched Hooters Air, Brooks founded the USAR Hooters Pro Cup Series, which eventually turned into a major event in the stock car racing circuit. Brooks also branched out into other sports when the Miami Hooters became part of the Arena Football League. By the turn of the millennium, Hooters was a well-oiled machine generating plenty of profit. What started out as a novelty restaurant known for its waitstaff's nearly theoretical uniforms had become a global enterprise. In one of his last great moves as Hooters majority owner and worldwide wing commander, Brooks launched the Hooters Casino Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada on February 2, 2006, and the weekend of Super Bowl XL. The 696-room hotel and casino was positioned right off the bustling Vegas Strip, and like every other Hooters venture, it found immediate success. With Hooters expanding into air travel, major sporting events, and the hotel and casino game, along with countless other ventures, the good times seemed like they were going to continue forever. 
which is right around when the good times almost invariably come to an end. Hooters had always courted controversy, but the chain had previously managed to find ways to skirt the law. In 1995, when the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission demanded that Hooters pay $22 million in restitution to more than 500 men who applied and were denied employment, Brooks and the chain fought the allegations. Thanks to a team of smart lawyers and a grassroots March on Washington protest, Brooks was able to argue that the Hooters girls were necessary to the normal operations of the brand's success, and he won. Dozens of other similar lawsuits followed, and Hooters was always about to come to terms with the allegations, settle out of court, and keep their brand relatively clean. But like a lot of sexually charged ideas that seemed like a good idea at the time, such as Jiggle Television and Chippendales, later sensibilities were not going to be kind to Hooters. It didn't take many more lawsuits for Hooters to begin to be perceived by the general public as a little dated, if not overtly sexist. By the 2010s, the writing began to start forming on the walls. Brand Index, a company that specializes in tracking brand health and growth, found that Hooters' rapidly declining revenue was based on the fact that customers began feeling uncomfortable around the scantily clad waitresses. A few years later, the University of Tennessee's psychology department conducted a study of waitresses who worked in a Hooters environment and found that these women suffered from some degree of depression, anxiety, anger, confusion, and feelings of degradation. They also reported feeling demeaned on a regular basis, the licensed leer that Naya Rivera had mentioned. With the recent focus of the Me Too movement, Hooters has been under scrutiny for being sexist and outdated, and it's finally affecting the bottom line. Eventually, the airline, the hotel and casino, the golf tournament, and the motorsports endorsements went away, and Hooters has been struggling ever since. The company may not have helped themselves when they recently doubled down in 2021 with even skimpier uniforms. Soon, Hooters girls even went on social media to criticize their redesigned uniforms, which weren't much more than a high-cut thong. Was it a desperate attempt by Hooters to spark interest in the brand? Some critics thought so. After all, Hooters is no longer the only restaurant in town. Now diners who want their food served to them in scantily dressed waitresses have choices like the Tilted Kilt, Redneck Heaven, Twin Peaks, Bone Daddies, Mugs and Jugs, and many more. While Hooters is still hanging in there with a little over 300 locations, the question is, now that the Hooters girls have now been deemed a relic of the 80s, how long can their hot wings keep them afloat? And speaking of which, you gotta wonder, how many flotation device jokes did they make on Hooters Air? So what do you think? What's your opinion of Hooters? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History Food.